I just think it's hard to become money. We only know two digital assets have, that have ever done it, Bitcoin, ETH. And I suspect that part of that is because of the fact that ETH and Bitcoin are constrained at the base layer. As a result, it forces this asymmetry of demand or incongruity of demand with respect to supply, and it forces it to be deflationary. So I don't know if it's possible for that to ever happen again. It seems like more as like a freak accident of history, where if you tried to deploy a constrained base layer today, people would be like, why would I use that over Celestia, Solana, all the other guys? But that basically means that only ETH and Bitcoin will ever be money. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Celestia just launched and is already worth over $20 billion at the time of recording. That's the 11th most valuable crypto asset. We also have Eigen DA, that's coming out soon. And today we're taking an in-depth look, an exploration of data availability. It's also known as DA, also known as data publishing. If all of that sounds like a lot, don't worry. We spend the first 10 minutes of the episode actually explaining it and why it is so important to understanding block space and your broader crypto journey. So the topics today, number one, data availability. What is it? Why does it matter? Number two, what does cheap DA unlock for Web3? Number three, is it even a good business model? How valuable is it to be a DA provider? Number four, we get right into the heart. Tia is worth $20 billion. Why? Is this actually a race to the bottom? Is this a race for a commodity? What does the future have in store for the entire market? There has been this growing hype and excitement inside of the Celestia ecosystem now being um, packaged up in the Tia is modular money, a meme. Uh, this is partly an exploration into that subject matter, uh, maybe a prep for a conversation I'm going to have with Nick White from Celestia exploring that meme, unpacking that meme specifically. This, this I think, is more of a, a third party bird's eye view exploration of the, the nature of DA. Um, what is this business model? What are the margins like? What are the cash flows like? Why is DA valuable? What is the long-term future of DA? Why will DA consumers like rollups and other chains and other ecosystems, why, what choices will they make and why will they make them? Uh, I think this, uh, the content in this episode is going to illustrate some of the decision trees that many rollup providers, DA purchasers, are going to have to make in the coming years uh, as this whole DA... Um, DA universe unfolds. We also, of course, get into conversations around proto dank sharding and full dank sharding. And what is this difference between Ethereum native DA for Ethereum native rollups versus alt DA? There is a big choice between choosing, electing to consume Ethereum DA versus non-Ethereum DA. What is the nature of that choice? The two guests that we have on the episode today, John Charbonneau from DBA. People will know John. He writes insanely depth research articles all about different subjects inside of the Ethereum and broader crypto world. And also Neil Somani from Eclipse. We've had on Neil once before. He is the guy building the Solana virtual machine as a layer two on Ethereum consuming Celestia for DA. So both of these guys know a thing or two about the world of DA and the choices around that ecosystem. As a disclaimer before we get into the episode, we are advisors for Eigenlayer, the producers of EigenDA, which was brought up a handful of times throughout this episode. And also, John's investment firm, DBA, is an investor in Eclipse, who the other guest, Neil, is the CEO of. So let's go ahead and get right into the episode. Is DA a good business model? But first, I want to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, especially Kraken, our preferred exchange for crypto in 2024. If you do not have an account with Kraken, consider clicking the links in the show notes, getting started with Kraken today. If you want a crypto trading experience backed by world-class security and award-winning support teams, then head over to Kraken, one of the longest standing and most secure crypto platforms in the world. Kraken is on a journey to build a more accessible, inclusive, and fair financial system, making it simple and secure for everyone, everywhere, to trade crypto. Kraken's intuitive trading tools are designed to grow with you, empowering you to make your first or your hundredth trade in just a few clicks. And there's an award-winning client support team available 24-7 to help you along the way, along with a whole range of educational guides, articles, and videos. With products and features like Kraken Pro and Kraken NFT Marketplace and a seamless app to bring it all together, it's really the perfect place to get your complete crypto experience. So check out the simple, secure, and powerful way for everyone to trade crypto, whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned pro. Go to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Celo is the mobile-first EVM-compatible carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. Driving 
using real world use cases like mobile payments and mobile DeFi, and with Opera Minipay as one of the fastest growing Web3 wallets, Celo is seeing a meteoric rise with over 300 million transactions and 1.5 million monthly active addresses. And now Celo is looking to come home to Ethereum as a layer two. Optimism, Polygon, Matter Labs, and Arbitrum have all thrown their hats in the ring for the Celo layer two to build upon their stacks. Why the competition? The Celo layer two will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability secured by Ethereum validators, and one block finality. What does that all mean for you? With Celo layer two, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas natively using ERC20 tokens, sending crypto to phone numbers across wallets using Social Connect. But Celo is a community governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forums, follow Celo on Twitter and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. Are you launching a token? Is it already live? How are you managing the legal and tax obligations for providing token grants to your team? It's no secret that token management gets complicated. Between learning all the legal language and tax obligations in every country that your team is in, token grant management can feel like an obstacle course, but it doesn't have to. That's where Toku steps in. Toku provides practical tools to handle token grants, allowing for effective oversight of token distributions and payroll tax compliance for employees, contractors, advisors, and investors. They also handle tax withholding through their real-time tax calculations that can be done by Toku or integrated into any payroll EOR providers in any jurisdiction. Toku is a trusted provider of Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Mina Protocol, and many more. Get started for free and make token compensation simple at toku.com slash bankless. Bankless Nation, I'm so excited to introduce you to John Charbonneau, a researcher investor at DBA. John is known for writing some of the longest and deepest research pieces out there, exploring the frontiers of all of the leading ecosystems that we have in crypto, Ethereum, Celestia, Solana, wherever there are interesting research topics, John is out there sifting for gold. John, welcome back to Bankless. How's it going? Good to be on again. Neil Somani is the CEO of Eclipse, a project bringing the SVM to an Ethereum layer two. Eclipse uses Ethereum for settlement, Solana VM for execution, Celestia for data availability, and Risk Zero for proof verification. And Neil, like John, has been on the forefront of the modular design space. And if you couldn't tell from how Eclipse is constructed, he has a thing or two to teach us about the role that data availability has to play in the world of network design. Neil, also welcome back to Bankless. Thanks for having me, guys. So there is a broader conversation, I think, ha going on right now about more or less what the hell is DA, what the hell is data availability, and not just from a technical perspective, which we will also just answer that one-on-one -on -one question, but also qualitatively, what does it mean to have good DA? What does it mean to have bad DA? Uh, is DA a commodity? How? What is the future of DA? Is it the bandwidth of Web3? What is its future role and trajectory as the future of DA um, uh, expands. And, but I, in order to really just nail down the one-on-ones, I want to just define data availability. It's a weird term. It's one of these weird terms that the crypto industry comes up with. Normies will hear it and they're like, this is whatever podcast I'm listening to is not for me. Uh, maybe John, you can start by kind of laying down some foundation. What is DA? How is it a part of just blockchains? Uh, and w why is it important? Yeah, one of the many unfortunately named things in blockchain, mm -hmm. which we've kind of realized after a couple of years still isn't super clear. Um, so, I mean, kind of, it's kind of helpful to start with like the basic idea of like, what is a blockchain in the first place? It's like some way for us to agree on some form of shared state and like we can update that thing and then we agree on the new shared state of the world. Um, so like fundamentally what you want to have there is everyone knows what the state of the world is and then like knows what it's correct. Um, and kind of fundamentally to do that, you both need to be able to like verify that this like new state that you've been told um, is correct. And also just to like have all the data there in the first place, just to know that and understand what it is. Um, so like the the most concrete way. So while I, so what you should also realize from that is like we always talk about it in the roll up context for the most part. Um, but fundamentally, every blockchain ensures data availability like that is just a fundamental guarantee of them. Um, roll ups just kind of highlight it and that we kind of like strip it out and think about it separately, which is why we've just always kind of like taken it for granted that every blockchain ensures data availability by default of full nodes just download all the data. And if all the data is there, then you know that the data is available. If the data is missing, then you shouldn't sign off on that block. Um, that's like generally how any traditional blockchain would work, whether it's Solana, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. Um, for rollups, the like the area where it gets highlighted and we see it differently um, is they are posting their data to another chain, to a chain like Ethereum, um, and you will see data availability. You need it for, for example, like the clearest example is for optimistic rollups. Um, you know, you can't make a fraud proof. 
um, to show that like some state transition was invalid if you don't have the data available. Um, so while it's something that we kind of like highlight and see differently in the rollup world, that is just fundamentally a guarantee that like any blockchain needs to have is, hey, if we're all going to agree on what like the state of the world is and everything about it, you need to know what the data is. Um, so it's just like a very fundamental guarantee so, for any blockchain. So John, if, we're, if this is a core fundamental guarantee of blockchains, what do they do? They, they tell you whether the state of the world is true or not, right? Okay, so, and then we have in, in kind of these modules, sort of the, what we've talked about is the consensus layer, the data availability layer, and then the execution layer. One framing of this that I've had is like the consensus layer tells us like what's just happened or like what's true. And I think that like that. And the DA layer is like what's happened in the recent past. It's kind of like there's some history sort of, sort of archive uh, associated with it. Um, tell me if that framing works for you or, or how you'd modify that in, in terms of what we're actually concretely talking about here. So it's not so much the history, um, and this is part of the reason why I would say data availability was in a kind of unfortunate name in hindsight, because it does sound like that. Um, but we're really referring to just a very like short term guarantee of I am able to download this data and I know that it's available. It's not a guarantee that like you can go get the data from five years ago that Ethereum had or anything like that. Um, that like kind of historical storage requirement is a little different. John, Dankrad has called it data publishing. Do you, do you like Yes. It, so it, I definitely do think it is clearer. Um, a lot of the other data availability people are also in favor of like Mustafa and Celestia. Like th I think they're generally in favor of it. I think it is just so hard to like change the name of it at this point um, to something that is like probably a little bit better, but has just been memed into this gigantic thing over time. Um, but that but that is a clearer way to think of it. Um, and that is like actually how the idea was kind of described in the first place, like back in Bitcoin world is basically is this. And, and when we when we say data publishing is is maybe clear because like I, I guess that's what in fact we are doing when, when I think most normal people they hear the word publishing they they think about it in a non blockchain context so they think about like publishing to the web or I'm publishing my blog or I'm publishing this uh, podcast to my RSS feed right but yeah. when we're talking about data publishing or AKA data availability we'll use those terms interchangeably through the rest of this episode we're talking about publishing that data to the blockchain, right? So, and again, what do blockchains do? It's sort of a, a, you know, truth computer for us. It's a truth engine. It's a, it's a trusted compute layer. So that's what we mean in this context of, of data publishing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You could also publish to the internet and that would be some yeah. form of data publication. Yes. It's just very bad DA uh, as opposed yeah. to a blockchain, which is the gold standard. Okay. Yeah. Bad DA. Bad DA. Can we like unpack that a little bit? <laughs> yeah. why, why is that bad DA? And can you like frame it up as like, okay, di in crypto, did we invent good DA? So Neil, what 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 is why did what did you mean by bad DA? And then maybe you can also go into what is good DA. So to me, good DA is something that's one verifiable. So anyone could determine whether a DA was performed properly and whether the data was actually published. And second, it has better liveness properties. Meaning that on the internet, theoretically, whatever web server you publish that to, they could refuse to serve you that block. And that's okay for archival data, just because you don't actually need that to determine the fork choice rule and to determine the current state of the chain, as John was pointing out, once you've already finalized a particular tip or a particular history. But um, but for good DA, it's probably better to, to optimize on good DA for things like um, like when you're in the active process of final of finalization. So Neil, when you say good versus bad, right, we're, we're starting to um, add some subjectivity to this, I think. And like maybe the question is like good for what or bad for what? Because I think the way I publish, you know, my uh, newsletter is probably fine for the purposes of a newsletter. It's just content that I'm trying to, I don't, I don't need sort of the trust guarantees of a blockchain. But maybe you might argue is bad for use cases like, um, let's say, transferring millions of dollars, large amounts of, of value. So with, with what kind of context or what types of apps are you, are you judging uh, DA through this lens of good versus bad? Is it basically internet of value types of apps? You need stronger DA guarantees, whereas like just communications, regular old internet, copy paste, JPEG type apps, it's fine to just use the protocol layer of the internet. Yeah, t tell me about that. I think it's more about what's the threat if data were to be withheld. And sometimes that's a more meaningful way to think about DA in the context of a data withholding attack, meaning if someone didn't give you this data, what's the worst damage they could cause? And 
for example, for a blockchain, once something is already finalized, if they withheld historical data, that might mean it's harder to bootstrap a new full node and you can't replay history from the beginning of time. But at the end of the day, you know that there was some safety guarantee given by the fact that the whole quorum voted off on something and you had consensus at some point. Whereas if something has not even been finalized and someone without data, then you could actually have forks, you could have safety violations, uh, and then it's much more meaningful to have good DA in, in those circumstances. So what can happen if the data is withheld? I guess the stakes are higher with high value use cases, like actual you know, peer-to-peer uh, money transfers, that sort of thing. Whereas so it depends on the depends on the blockchain. So for an L1, if you withheld data, then the blockchain would literally fork, and then you'd have two sets of participants: some which have seen the blocks, and some which have not. And then it depends on who you're connected to, uh, in terms of what state you're going to be receiving. But if you're an L2, then that means that Ethereum, the Ethereum bridge could literally be compromised in the case of an optimistic rollup, where the executor could publish an invalid state route. And then theoretically, if the block were withheld, then no one would be able to wipe that invalid state commitment and would eventually be finalized. So those are the, it, it somewhat depends on uh, what the blockchain construction is to determine what's the worst case outcome of a data withholding attack. Okay, John, I'm just, you know, m- mining for data here. Do you, you have anything else to add to like, to just explaining data publishing and data availability to, to normies? What else would you add to kind of tie us off? And then we'll get into the deeper subjects here. I think we covered it well there. I I would just finish it with like that simple mental model and description of publication probably is the right one for most people to think of it in the same way that, you know, you can publish something to any website. And based off of that, we can have some reasonable assumption that like everyone saw that data. And if it was there for long enough, everyone should have been able to download it. Um, But it's not a guarantee that like if you publish something that, you know, a year later, the website, you know, has taken it down or something else. Um, But your data was published. Um, and it's just a matter of like that strength of guarantee and that everyone saw it. And then we could all verify that together. I actually do really like bringing in the Web2 database conversation here, just as a frame of reference where we have like our censorable Substack or like our bankless YouTube that was actually taken down one time and deplatformed. Our data was withheld from us. And this is this has caused issues in like the Web2 space, like we call it deplatforming. Um, and then when you, you apply a new technology called a blockchain that introduces property rights and settlement guarantees withholding data is a same it's a similar problem but now we're talking about that data was actually your money like not just your youtube videos uh and so maybe maybe that can help uh, listeners come in and reframe this conversation for data availability john talking about it from an economics standpoint data availability is a commodity it, all blo- all blockchains have them. Bitcoin, uh, so like, just like you said, it's a core part of every blockchain. If you are a blockchain, you have data availability. Your blockchain has qualitative properties. Therefore, the data availability of your blockchain also has qualitative properties. Bitcoin is data availability with a proof of work mechanism. Ethereum is proof of stake with layer twos. How, but like data availability, it's a, it's a commodity, like it's a, it's a resource. How do we categorize this thing? I, I think that's a good way to categorize it is that, that that it is effectively just kind of a base commodity that um, is kind of an input to most of these systems. The way that most people will use that term then is to kind of try to make the point of, oh, it's a commodity, like these different things are all the same, whether I use Celestia or Avail or EigenDA or Ethereum, whatever, that it's just a commodity, you know, they're all kind of the same thing. Um, that is the part that I would, in practice at least, kind of disagree with and push back on um, is that like, I would agree that in the limit of like, if we have all these perfect systems and everyone is like, yeah, there's a bunch of perfect DA layers that have all the guarantees you want, then yeah, it should be like relatively fungible between them. Um, Practical reality is there is a very large difference, I would say, in the quality of block space that is being provided by one DA layer versus another one today. Um, Because otherwise you can take this to the extreme of, we're actually back to the web too, of like posting your data online, you know, is data availability in some sense. Like, why why don't we just put all of this on AWS? Like, why do we need a blockchain in the first place? Um, and so there very much is like this kind of spectrum of like there is different, I would say, qualities of block space. Um, and there's different features that come along with them of whether it's, you know, certain network effects of being in the same ecosystem together. Um, others lend themselves uh, much better to data availability, sam- data availability sampling, which means that people can more easily verify it. Um, so are these kind of like different features that definitely do differentiate in practice, like one DA layer versus another? In the short to medium term, I think that's true. I think in the long term, pretty much all these folks like Avail, Celestia, EigenDA, the features like data availability sampling and having really good decentralized relayers will essentially become table stakes. 
Because if they don't have those baseline features, even things like soft confirmations to better support based rollups, these constructions will become so popular that if you don't offer the features that are conducive to those constructions, you'll just be non-competitive. Uh, so that's kind of how I'm thinking about it in the long term. And then Ethereum DA obviously is in a category of its own, assuming you're using Ethereum for its for the fork choice rule, just given that now you're trust minimized with respect to Ethereum. Okay, so there's so many things uh, that like we we just brought up there. But so David's base question is, is DA a commodity? And your answer to that, both of you, I, I think you guys would say, yes, it's a commodity. And uh, Bankless listeners have heard us talk about um, block space as being sort of the core commodity that this entire revolution has uh, has created. Like the thing that we made was block space. And is it accurate to say, uh, John, that DA is just like one component of block space? And in fact, I- inside Ethereum on kind of like mainnet, before it sort of modularized and it sliced out DA as a separate part, it basically included DA as part of that block space. And just DA is just one component of the larger superset commodity, which is block space. Is that correct? Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, really data availability and then consensus over that is kind of like the fundamental baseline of what any blockchain um, is like looking to that you need to have and to provide for them. Okay, and then John, you were making the argument that not all DA is the same. So like com- some commodities, uh, of, like DA commodities have different properties than other commodities. But but Neil, you were just saying, well, well, actually that's true right now, but over time they'll sort of fuse fuse together. They'll become kind of like a, a baseline. This is the set of functionality and features that all DA has. And it will, I guess maybe another word is commodify, right? They'll all become kind of uh, similar to one another. But then you made an exception there, Neil, and you said, but uh, Ethereum DA might be in a category of its own. Can you say more about that? Like, why is Ethereum DA have any special status? And I would love uh, John's take on this too. So it's mostly because of the fact that rollups typically define their four choice rule on Ethereum. And this is actually something that we were chatting about with the Celestia team just recently. They said, why don't you just define your forks choice rule directly on Celestia in some way? And the reason for using Ethereum is that now, assuming you also offer force inclusion on Ethereum, then theoretically your rollup could operate even if Celestia goes down. And that's a pretty big advantage. So by using Ethereum for DA as well, it means that even in the happy path, you're um, you're only relying on Ethereum, and there's no risk that Celestia going down could impact the safety or liveness of your rollup. So that's the reason why it'd be different. But for example, if you were to have a rollup that's settled to Solana, then I'd argue you should also use Solana for DA, because that would be the trust minimized construction for that kind of rollup. Is what you're saying just there, Neil, is there's like um, a resonance between using the same layer for DA and settlement. Like if you're using both, and they're both are the same, there's just a little bit of um, uh, some greater than the parts uh, that emerges when you, when both the DA and the settlement are the same layer? It's essentially avoiding the same issues that come with bridging. Because mm-hmm. in order to use Celestia DA with Ethereum settlement, at some point you have to relay some data from Celestia, which is a signed data route. So everyone's posting their transactions to Celestia. Celestia Quorum signs off on some succinct representation of that, and that has to be relayed to Ethereum. And doing that in a decentralized and trustless way runs into the same exact issues that bridging runs into. Understood. Understood. Neil, you've also used this term fork choice rule. Could you just uh, unpack that a little bit for listeners who might not be familiar with that term? Just explain like I'm five what that means. So let's say I have some set of transactions and then I have an alternate set of transactions and they lead to different state routes. How do I decide which one is is canonical? As a That's fork a in fork, the chain. Yeah. yeah. And then choosing which fork you should go on is, or which fork is canonical is the fork choice rule. Okay, understood. Getting into just more of this, like the qualitative nature of this DA conversation, both of you have said like, yeah, DA is a commodity. And then also there's this set of features that all DA providers will need to be able to provide in order to be competitive at all. Which means uh, to me that there's like this natural convergence towards some conclusion about all competitive DA layers which also kind of sounds like there is it's a it's a race it's a race to this end conclusion and it's also like data is cheap in the grand scheme of things like i like uh, hardware is uh, f- like you know one terabyte is like not that much money these days it's like 25 dollars. is that a fair comparison and is that if like if data uh if data on a blockchain is is the cost of this approaching that level of commodity like nature where just DA costs are approaching, you know, zero. Is that is that a fair conclusion to arrive at? John, I'll, I'll start with you here. Definitely is a race towards this kind of like theoretical equilibrium 
of exactly what you described of it should basically approach like what is the cost operationally for the most part of like providing this service in the long run. Um, and I do think it will continue to trend closer to that over time. Um, the question is, uh, like there are many things that in crypto are in practice, this is the equilibrium and you end up here and then like, you know, everything is in practice though, you don't actually get there at least for a very, very long time. Um, there's a lot of markets. I mean, like the same thing as like proof of, uh, a proof of stake mechanism in theory, the equilibrium is like one person has all the stake and that's it. But generally in practice there's going to be a very long road to like actually get to those systems and it might not actually get there for this i would i would expect that in the long run the cost of like using one of these da layers does get pretty close to like some reasonable multiple on like what is the operational cost of like literally providing this like x amount of bandwidth that is replicate that is like replicated across n nodes and however many times um i i do think that you should approach that over time but in practice today i mean like we're so far away from that of like in reality, there is one specialized DA layer that is live today, like it's Celestia, and everyone else is like on the time span of like years. When does it actually get to something similar than that? And even Celestia is in its like very, very initial state where like their their current state now is nowhere near, oh yeah, we can just theoretically provide all the bandwidth that everyone needs and you know it's gonna cost 3x of like whatever the bandwidth cost is. Like it needs to scale like scale like a thousand times more um to start even getting close to those kinds of numbers. Okay, John, so your long-term prediction is that the cost of DA is going to decrease, right? Uh, similar to other collapsing, I guess, uh, you know, t tech costs, like something something equivalent to maybe like Moore's Law and that sort of thing. But that will take some time to play out uh, is, I, I guess, your prediction. And let, let's connect some dots for, for listeners right now about the implications of that, right? So there's a, a kind of, I guess, two uh, stakeholders we could talk about. One is the implications for value accrual and sort of investors who are looking at uh, DA layers themselves. Like if you're looking at something like Celestia or you're trying to invest in Eigen DA, the question is, what will this accrue value over time? Where where in the value chain is it? So there's a set of questions for investors, but there's also a set of uh, you know questions and answers for users. And I think one implication will just connect some dots very quickly is the cost of transacting on blockchains is going to decrease a whole lot in the near future and then a whole lot more by orders of magnitude in the long-term future. Maybe let's just talk about the the users because there's always going to be more users uh, than, than there is um, you know, investors here. And so is this effectively crypto's broadband moment when we see DA costs collapse to almost nothing? That means blockchain as a commodity, the usage of blockchain sort of collapse uh, towards zero. Um, what are the downstream effects on, on that of, of that for users? So it should mean at least the base input cost of spinning up one of these systems should approach zero um, or approach some reasonable multiple and like the literal operational cost of providing it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the specific application, the cost of using something has to go to zero. Um, there is still stickiness and value in like a specific piece of shared state on, on top of what may be a very cheap um, piece of DA. So like if you have an application that is super in demand, um, and that is on top of a DA layer that is like super, super cheap. Great. Your input costs are effectively zero. Um, but there still can be obviously a cost to interact with that application. Um, if it is valuable enough that they decide to like charge extra fees sure, and now sure. there is some premium on execution. Yeah. I get um, that. So it's de definitely understood. I'm, I'm just wondering if you kind of like, um, hold with uh, Chris Dixon's take on this and he calls himself sort of an infrastructure determinist, right? So when he sees the cost of infrastructure approaching zero, then he's like, oh, there's going to be incredible app ecosystem. And like, I don't even need to know what apps are built on top of this. I'm just going to invest in the thing that is, you know, uh, the infrastructure whose cost is approaching zero, right? And so uh, his take on this would be like, look at um, bandwidth scaling on the internet, right? And for some listeners getting involved in the internet, I mean, it's the era of dial-up modems, right? And uh, the 56K modem. And then we had our bandwidth era on, on the internet. And that didn't mean that the apps we used on top of the internet approach zero, but the bandwidth of those apps uh, was effectively multiplied by orders of magnitude. Do, do you like that analogy? Does that kind of work here? Are we about to enter a high bandwidth era with DA costs going so low? I think to some degree it's about like rewriting the software so it can take advantage of bandwidth increases. And that's what Dong Sharding is essentially doing, or the upgrade known as Dong Sharding is doing for Ethereum. And I think the phenomenon you're pointing out is essentially Nielsen's law. Every year there's some percent increase in bandwidth year over year. But I guess my point is that I don't know that before then 
there's anyone who's really properly positioned to take advantage of those bandwidth increases. Though there's Celestia, Solana, who claim that they're well positioned to, to take advantage of it. I think there's this informal like upper bound on how much bandwidth a blockchain can reasonably support because you need light nodes to actively verify the bandwidth. Um, so like to, to put it another way, if you look at Bitcoin, CPUs like kept increasing over law over time. Like we we have Moore's law. That's a true thing. Yet Bitcoin doesn't use more CPUs in the execution of programs, and that's intentional. It's because there's a security constraint that like the, those CPUs are used for civil resistance for Bitcoin, and they're not trying to use as many cores as possible. So similarly for blockchains, like some blockchains might have an informal design goal that they don't want to expand bandwidth too much because that can potentially compromise the security of the bandwidth uh, or the blocks that are being propagated. I think if uh, we do this episode well, the original motivation for this is really to understand the economics of selling data availability as your business. Uh, and uh, like, if we, if we have a bunch of DA providers, like where where do they end up on coin market cap? Is really like right. the, the goal I'm trying to get here. And and so and we already kind of talked about the race towards um, what John I think alluded to is like limited margins, and and we'll, I think we'll return there later. But first. In order to really answer one half of this question, I want to talk about the buy side, uh, which is the question of like, what does DA unlock? With cheap uh, DA, what are we able to do in crypto that we weren't able to do before? Like what new fertile grounds has does cheap DA uh, provide us? And Neil, your project at Eclipse, like I said in the intro, chose elected to use like Celestia DA for DA because Celestia has got the cheapest DA. So what did that choice unlock for you? Like what were you able to not do before and now you are able to do? And I think this conversation with Eclipse is actually will be the first of like a blossoming conversation for the future of rollups and even cheaper DA. But let's start with Eclipse. Like what could you do because you elected to choose Celestia DA? I think that's the right framing because if we were able to, we would have just used Ethereum DA if we were able to support the use cases that we wanted to. And I think that in the long run, we probably will migrate to Ethereum DA. But those use cases are things like central limit order books for a market maker to effectively use that and to submit cancel orders. Transactions have to be on the order of one one hundredth of a penny. And even one one ten, even one tenth of a penny is possibly doable. But beyond that, there's no way it's economical. So that's one use case. Things like less economical use cases, such as fully on chain games, deep in networks, even certain types of social, social networks. Like I'd argue the experience of using friend tech could have been potentially smoother if there was just more abundant block space and therefore transactions were able to flow through more easily. So those are categories of apps that I think are better enabled uh, when you have really cheap DA. I mean, that kind of just um, invokes memories of 2017 to me when we could daydream up anything uh, about some sort of crypto project. And it was all very high in the sky. It was all turned out to be like ICO mania at the time. But in hindsight, there were still like lots of nuggets of very broad, very grandiose ideas of what we could do with blockchains. And maybe DA was actually a fundamental constraint to every single one of them. There's a growing um, motivation for further experimentation in layer twos. Uh, we really like the last like two, three, four years of layer two experimentation has been relatively constrained. Maybe one of those constraints has been, well, we don't have the DA to really experiment with. Like John, maybe I'll, I'll ask you to kind of carry this conversation forward. Like cheap DA, like what can, what can the roll up landscape really do with cheaper DA? It basically enables all of these just types of applications of it. it. It is similar to any layer one being like cheap and scalable. It is fundamentally very similar to that. Um, it's mostly that L2s in particular have been the area of crypto that has had a very challenging time to do that. Um, like technically anything you could do on a roll up or an L2, like you could just do on a centralized server. Um, so it's a matter of being able to do it in the context of that type of chain um, and particularly like L2s for Ethereum. Um, where in practice, that is still where the majority of users and assets and interesting state and applications are, um, is built in some form on top of Ethereum, Ethereum layer twos. Um, and so trying to scale that to be cost competitive with everything else in crypto is obviously just a gigantic part of crypto because that's still where most of the value is. Um, so I, I would say disproportionately, it's enabling a lot of the Ethereum world, those types of assets. Um, and then also... While there have been other cheap blockchains, it's also particularly when it is the DA is catered towards, okay, spinning up a new blockchain on top of this, um, that is enabling a kind of new type of development that wasn't really possible before, um, where basically making it easier to spin up your own chain um, and the things that go along with that. So there is a difference in the entire design landscape of 
what can I do if I could just spin up my own chain and design it however I want and then don't worry about DA versus uh, if I can just, you know, make a smart contract on Solana that is theoretically like very cheap to execute, but I don't have all the customizability and control um, over. I may want to do something else with the execution environment. And that historically wasn't possible to like very easily spin up. I can't remember the name. I think there's a name for this, but um, uh, I remember this conversation started in Bitcoin land uh, in the big block versus small block debate where the small blockers were like, why don't we, if we just have big blocks, people will just fill them up again and then the fees will return to where they were in the first place. And that kind of, I think, same effect happen, might happen and will happen, hopefully happens with cheap DA. Whereas in all, we just like, you know, lower the cost of DA by one one thousandths. But then what we what do we do? We just have 1,000 or more times the total aggregate economic activity going on on blockchains, which is the bull case, right? Like imagine having 10,000 more times economic activity happening in, gra- in the grander like crypto sphere. Uh, and maybe this was why Ryan called it like crypto's like broadband moment where like you scale down costs, but then you scale up total aggregate usage um, uh, even more. Is this kind of how you, is this way where you think this is going, John? The, the difficult part of it is that I think it's just almost inherently possible for any of us to reason about like, what is the right order of magnitude of this terminal end state of there are people who will make reasonable arguments that, you know, the end state of what you really need to scale the 99.9% of value in crypto is like a hundred thousand TPS or something like that, mm. um, which you could very reasonably provide on like probably like one chain. And I think there's a very reasonable argument that it's like, no, it's like a hundred trillion. And these are just like orders of magnitude that are just nonsensical. And they're just, both are like reasonable in a sense of like, okay, but what if like everything is on a system similar to this? And you end up with like pretty radically different outcomes, um, obviously mm. between those two. Um, I like I, I tend towards the latter and that you're going to have many of these types of systems over time um, and that you will be able to just kind of continuously like horizontally scale these systems and add more of them. When you say like hundreds of thousands of or even greater like TPS numbers to me at that, that point, once we start to break that metric, it just means infinity. Like yeah. un, uncapped demand, uncapped limit constraints on transactions. Yeah. Like, oh, do we need more? Spin up a new chain and and then also new data will come online and be ready for you. Is that, is that maybe another articulation? Yeah, I would agree with that. And I, and I think there is a reasonable argument that that doesn't happen. Like there is some reasonable argument to that, that like 99% of the value really is in that handful of size that we can like reason about and understand this is like a few chains can really handle this versus the latter outcome is what I actually expect. It gets to that point of like, okay, beyond this point, it's we need to scale for infinity. Like that, like that's what you need to build these systems for effectively is just to like keep adding more to it. Um, and I, I think that's in practice much more likely. It's kind of like asking what's the terminal uh, endpoint destination of internet bandwidth. Like, do yeah. we have enough yet? Mm-hmm. Like, no, yeah. we can never have enough because <laughs> once we is have it more, always too slow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it always is. I don't know. I, I never have enough uh, data in my mobile plan either. Uh, Neil, I want to. I want to go back to you. Um, something that you were saying earlier. And this goes to the kind of the question at the genesis for for um, this podcast in general, which is where does value uh, accrual for you know, like where where does uh, Celestia or any other asset kind of end up in the coin market cap? And you've got a unique vantage point in that you are a buyer here, like you are buying DA, aren't you? And it's very interesting because like it's not actually the users that decide what DA to buy, at least you know, like not anymore. It's sort of the the entrepreneurs, it's kind of like the business owners, if you will. It's sort of like Eclipse saying, we're going to use Celestia rather than some other DA layer right now. And I want to go into like why you chose Celestia, for example. And then you you, you had you, you made another statement when you were talking a minute or two ago about at some point we might migrate to Ethereum, right? Which like has an interesting implication of like what's different versus Celestia versus uh, Ethereum, and why might you want to migrate to a different DA provider like Ethereum? What advantages does it have for you? Can you talk about your decision of where to go buy your DA? In the long run, the choice of DA would be decided by Eclipse governance. But to start, we chose Celestia primarily because it's the only live DA that exists right now, other than Ethereum L1, that is considered actually verifiable DA. And then the second reason was that a lot of the surrounding infrastructure either was already built or was very close to being built. So the name of their relayer is called Blobstream, and that's the part that relays that signed data route over to Ethereum. And to have a live relayer that's actually credibly trustless 
I place a high premium on that because I know how difficult it is to build that. And that's the one part about these modular systems that everyone points to it as a downside. Luckily, it's something that we're all very aware of, but it's the amount of relaying that, if, that you have to do between Eclipse and Ethereum, Ethereum and Celestia, Eclipse and Celestia. So having all of that in place uh, was one consideration. The second reason was that to me, like I was saying earlier, being on Ethereum DA natively versus anything else is relatively zero one to me. So the difference between Eigen DA versus Celestia DA is relatively marginal compared to the big jump in, uh, in security you get by just being directly on Ethereum. So to me, it's unlikely that we would migrate away from Celestia in the short to medium term, unless there was something fundamentally unsuitable about it, meaning that it was just too congested or Eigen DA had some fundamental net new innovation that Celestia just can't incorporate for whatever reason. But those are the reasons why we'd migrate to another alt DA, which to me, the, the set of those reasons is pretty limited. Whereas migrating to Ethereum native DA is much more compelling if it were economical to do so. Why? Why is that more compelling? Why is Ethereum native DA more compelling to you? Mostly about just keeping consensus and DA in the same place. And then we can we don't we can avoid that relaying. And it also means that it's less complexity for the Eclipse full nodes to run. Because right now the Eclipse full nodes have to run a Celestia node, an Ethereum node. They have to do a lot of um like the verifiers need to check in multiple places. Forced inclusion becomes a very complicated design. Whereas if we were just using Ethereum for everything, it vastly simplifies a lot of those considerations. Okay, got it. And uh, you know, obviously, you know, for the cost. So you're saying if Celestia DA and Ethereum uh, DA were the same cost, you'd basically you'd prefer Ethereum DA. But um, Ethereum DA is not going to be the same cost, like maybe ever, ever. And so um, I, I'm curious, how cheap would it have to get for you to actually port? Uh, some DA to Ethereum, or maybe maybe it's an all or nothing decision. I, I don't quite understand. But like one upgrade that's coming probably in the next you know six weeks to two month, uh, months or so is Ethereum's implementation of EIP four eight four four, which is proto dank sharding. So I think uh, you were referring to dank sharding earlier in the episode. Uh, maybe you're referring to it as in its final form. Proto dank sharding makes DA cheaper on Ethereum. I don't know that it's cheap enough for you though, Neil. Maybe maybe you can talk about the decision about how cheap Ethereum DA would need to get for you to consider migrating. So if it could achieve that relative order of magnitude of one one hundredth of a penny per, let's say, an AMM swap or a clob order, then that's definitely compelling. I also think that things like blob space fractionalization and financialization make this a little bit easier. Right now, there seems to be, I don't want to say consensus, but there's a general sentiment within EF and on, and on ETH research that uh, the cost for even proto dong sharding is going to hit the floor. They feel that those blobs are going to be mostly empty, at least to start. So that's promising. Um, I don't know if that's true in practice, because the reality is if they were empty, Eclipse is going to eat all of them, or at least we would have ambitions to use a lot of that blob space. Okay, yeah, that's I guess the other consideration here is that you you might have more bidding on Ethereum blob space, you know, versus other DA layers, like because you're not the only builder, you're not the only buyer of a DA, are you? Like it's like a there there are many rollups who actually want to go purchase a DA, and so that could drive the costs of Ethereum DA upwards if it's more in demand versus other DA systems. Is that right? Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's DA spam, like inscriptions and things like that, that'll pop up relatively shortly. Just just curious, what do you think of, um, while we're on the, the subject of Ethereum and proto-dank sharding and, and dank sharding, which is just like, these are um, Ethereum terms, Ethereum developer terms for basically the massive expansion and cost reduction, let's say high bandwidth of uh, Ethereum's you know, like native DA layer or data publishing layer. Maybe we should get back to that uh, framing as well to remind folks. What, what do you think of their strategy there, Neil? Do you, do you think that full dank sharding will kind of get you what what it needs? Or is this just sort of an infinite game where we can never have enough data availability on Ethereum? Well, with full dank sharding, that gets you to 10,000 TPS in its full form. And that's assuming no additional increases from Nielsen's law and no additional upgrades afterwards. As a and, layer two, not the layer uh, one. Uh, as yeah, on the layer twos, yeah, on the layer twos, um, yeah, the layer one would not increase uh, as a result of dank sharding, but I think that that's pretty compelling. Just because if you look at even the highest throughput blockchains like Solana, the amount of real economic activity that occurs on Solana, even right now, and this is a very like bull market type speculative market for Solana as it exists, it's less than a thousand TPS. And if you were to fix the fee market on Solana, that is, if you removed all the spam and things like that, it's going to be on the order of hundreds of TPS. 
So I think 10,000 is a pretty generous overestimate of the amount of meaningful economic activity that occurs in crypto. So if you go in John's version of events where like we just fill up all the block space that's available, then of course we'll have to continually adapt. And to speak to that point earlier, I think that we would need some kind of net new upgrade that better takes advantage of the increases from Nielsen's law rather than um, than just like capping the number of blobs at 64 or 32. I think with the introduction of proto dank sharding, it will be a big step forward for Ethereum and, and data availability. I think we get three three blobs per block. Yet also in perfect Ethereum fashion, it will be far too little for what the market actually wants at that present moment in time. It's really going to be full dank sharding that I think is really going to finally move the needle. Uh, and full dank sharding is a 2026 thing, maybe. Uh, I don't think anyone really knows the answer to when full dank sharding is coming. But um, John, do you have any sort of indication about like how competitive full Ethereum layer one uh, dank sharding will be with like a more specific DA layer like Celestia? Like, will it, will it be one to one competitive? Will it still be relatively constrained? Do you have any like numbers or indication about this? I'm a bit more on the side of I think that most of these other DA layers are probably going to meaningfully outpace um, Ethereum on kind of DA bandwidth in the long term. I mean, it, in theory, there's nothing that Ethereum can't do um, that these other chains can do. Um, in practice, it is really hard to steer the moving ship, as we see with stuff like 4844 um, taking quite a while and reasonably so. Like they're going to be more conservative. And just as a result of that, I think that you are going to see just kind of by default, by the time when these upgrades start to ship over time, it is going to be not enough to like actually move the needle on where do new use cases go. Um, I, I think that that is going to be the current, the continued trend of, I think that stuff like 4854 is going to certainly be helpful to chains like Optimism and Arbitrum that are existing on Ethereum. I don't think that that or probably even future upgrades are going to be enough that will move the needle like materially of, hey, if I'm spinning up a new chain like Eclipse, uh, like by default, where do I go for that kind of chain? I think that most of those are still going to go to the Celestias, the Eigendias, the Avails, the whatever of the world. I, my guess is that All they will days. still be materially cheaper. Um, I think that would be very different if this equation was, okay, we get like the full like pretty much extent of what's a reasonable dank sharding today of like, cool, we have 16 megabytes of useful data per block. If that shipped like tomorrow, I think that's a very different world. Uh, my inclination is there's like a pretty meaningful path dependence of this. And assuming that takes a few years, the game has probably just shifted materially by that point. I think the interesting question would be then is to kind of what you're talking about before of like, okay, let's see that something of that order of magnitude shows up in, you know, two, three years from now. Does it make sense for someone like Eclipse or other chains to kind of migrate back? Um, I, I think that would be very dependent on the use case. Um, I mean, the reason why in theory it would be interesting for someone like Eclipse um, and comparable chains is like, if you have a presumption that the majority of assets on this kind of chain are ETH, like they are ETH denominated, it's a lot of ETH that's in the bridge there. Like fundamentally, it is that kind of zero to one of the best thing possible is always to have ETH DA if you're using ETH on an L2. But I tend to think that you're not going to see most of that activity moving back. Um, the trend that we see now is like more likely directionally to keep unfolding. Interesting. So one other direction it could move in is if proving costs go down. Right now, proving overhead is something like 100,000 times to a million. But if it could get down to, let's say, 4,000 times overhead, then pretty much all rollups, I think, would transition just being ZK rollups. And then you just post a state diff, which is far more economical than the amount of data that optimistic rollups have to post. Because from Eclipse's perspective, our trade-off was basically, what's cheaper, the cost of proving every transaction or the cost of posting every transaction? And ultimately, right now, it's obviously publishing every transaction is way cheaper, just given the existence of Celestia. But I could totally see risk zero becoming way more economical, and then we would just prove everything. Just to unpack that a little bit. Okay, so we have posting and proving. Once something is proved... Like that's then it's the, there's been a, a ton of computation to, in order to make that proof, and that's the cost. Or you post and you just consume the data, and that's the cost. So it's like pre or post, just to unpack that a little bit. And pre is like the zk rollup side of things with a lot more research and hardware acceleration is something that we still need to uh, unlock here. Uh, and a lot of a lot of you know activities on optimistic rollups who are doing posting data posting, and we actually have a solution here for that. It's called Celestia. Uh, just to unlock, is that is that kind of a, the right framing for that, Neil? Yep. 
basically you're you're posting some amount of data in either scenario. It's just that if right. you are ZK, you have this option to pretty meaningfully reduce potentially, depending on the right. use case, um, the amount of data you need to post because now you don't need to throw everything on there. You could just post mm -hmm. state disk. And, which and is like so material. what you're saying to Neil is that proving is very expensive on Ethereum right now. I, I'm just curious, like you mentioned Risk Zero. They've been on the podcast before, but I'm sure bankless listeners will have long forgotten that episode in that context. So like, what what is this this alternate path, just to just scope that out really quick, how does proving costs actually go down on Ethereum? Like what, is this a, a, another solution that needs to be injected? Is there sort of like a, a need for a Celestia of proving costs or something like this? W what sort of solutions uh, does this actually look like in practice? So it's not really like an Ethereum specific issue. It's just that proving overall is pretty expensive and there's a lot of overhead for doing so. So for every, usually the way you measure it is for every cycle of compute, how many cycles does that correspond to in your prover? And right now it's somewhere on the order of 100,000 to realistically about a million cycles for every cycle in your regular program. So what, what this would require is basically folks such as Axiom, Risk Zero, other ZK coprocessors or provers just to drastically optimize what they're doing. And I think that in the direction of EVMs, typically they've had their own ZK provers that are specific to their EVM implementation. And that's what folks like ZK Sync did. For Eclipse, we were generally erring toward general purpose provers. And the reason for that is my suspicion is that the overhead for general purpose proving will eventually reduce the order of thousands. So um, so that's the, the reason why we figure why build your own circuit if you can rely on some existing infrastructure, which is going to naturally improve as hardware gets better. Going back to something that John made me think of when he was giving his um, just like the migration of uh, consumption of DA down to like the, the cheaper and cheaper DA, like the Celestias, uh, away from like Ethereum DA because Ethereum is going to be slow. But he said, John said, you said like, you know, it's going to be the optimisms and the arbitrums and like the polygons that are going to stay using Ethereum DA. And I'm kind of um, imagining two lines here. Uh, two lines that could cross like one is the ethereum da line like you either are or aren't using that and then in the the next uh, section and you cross one line and you're in um like you're using an alt da right you're using celestia you're using eigen da polygon avail like whatever and then you cross that line and then you start to like use maybe something like um arbitrum AnyTrust, where you're using maybe like a consortium of like web2 databases like google amazon whatever uh, like Arbitrum Antitrust is like kind of the WBTC model, except instead of a multi-sig for an assets, it's like a multi-sig for DA. But you really, you're just using like five or six like centralized like uh, databases. And then and those are the three like data availability sources. Or you could just go in straight to like one single server. AWS so is on the far end of that spectrum. On the right? far <laughs> end of the spectrum, right? Like we're back in web two. So maybe these are like the ways to carve it out. And um, you have uh, like the back onto the Ethereum DA side of things. What makes the choice of a rollup to use Ethereum DA or hop into an alt DA might just have to be like brand, right? Are you, are you, are, are you aligned with Ethereum, right? Like how, like you said, like how much ETH is in your rollup bridge? Like, are you Ethereum denominated? Like Optimism, Arbitrum, Polygon, these are, are all people in heavy competition to not just like, you know, scale themselves, but to scale Ethereum because they all want you to think that they are Ethereum. So maybe it's like brand that is really the motivating factor for some of these choices. And for the other ones, like the the Lyras and the Avos that have uh, spun up their OP stack chains, but they're using Celestia DA, they don't necessarily need to have that strong of brand affinity with Ethereum. They need to really like reduce their costs. Uh, and so they've chosen to be like using Celestia for, for DA. And that's kind of going to be like the long tail. And so maybe what uh, proto dang sharding and then full dang sharding does, John, Neil, check me on this, is just like it opens up that room. It opens up the room to have to actually use Ethereum DA, the fat tail, and have that like strong brand and security alignment. Like I actually don't store any of my assets on layer twos that aren't like Arbitrum, Polygon, or Optimism because of just security reasons. Like I, I, if I use a nap chain, I use it and then I get out just because like, yeah, you guys are, you guys are using an alt DA. You guys aren't using Ethereum. Uh, and so that it's, there's like the security properties of Ethereum are retained by this fat tail. This high brand alignment affinity with Ethereum. And then more of like the quicker application specific stuff, the super cheap stuff, you're starting to use like the, the long tail of, of alt DAs. Is that if that's like kind of my, my, qualitative nature of the, the, some of these things. Does that resonate with you, John? Does that make sense? 
I agree with that. Um, I just think that directionally, that effect is going to even out much more over time and kind of weaken. Of It's that kind of brand and simplicity and reliability and all of those things of like, you, you can just tell someone, oh, yeah, we're in Ethereum roll up. Like, we just use Ethereum. It's very simple for a user to understand. They don't have any follow up questions. Oh, cool. It's secure. I get it. I understand it. As you start telling people like, oh, yeah, we're doing like any trust and there's this like 11 of 12. And if like two of them say no, then we fall back and you just start going through all those things um, and people's eyes just like start to glaze over and they're like, all right, man, like is my money safe or not? Like, what is this thing? Um, and my pretty strong assumption is like over time, all of these, the the top notch of like reliable ones will become very normalized once you have a dozen chains that are meaningful and people are using chains that are like built on top of Eclipse that are layer two is like Eclipse and others that are like, yeah, we use a Celestia DA. And that is like, people get used to that of like, oh yeah, Avo is Celestia, Eclipse is Celestia. Like all these things are Celestia. Um, and that becomes like another simple, understandable brand for these people. And you get really comfortable with those things. Um, and I think that there's just going to be a slow trend of those things. And I can DA will probably hit that at some point too. Um, but you can't just do that if you spin up some random DA layer today of like, oh, don't worry, like I forked Celestia. It's exactly the same. Like, trust my chain. It's like, it's like totally cool. Like, you're not going to get people to move over to that thing. Um, so I, I think that directionally, we will keep moving in this direction. People will get more comfortable with this, like, understandable uh, group of, like, very reliable, good operators. And, like, people like Celestia are, are increasingly falling into that bucket. If, like, people are, like, understanding now what this thing is. Okay, I, under, I can get my head around it. This feels safe. Like, I use a bunch of stuff on here. Yeah, totally agree with that. I think the architectures will converge as John's describing. Because if you look at the layer one blockchain landscape, there were so many novel architectures that were postulated and it ultimately did converge on pretty much Tendermint. Like everyone uses Tendermint if you're spinning up a new L1, including Celestia. And I wouldn't be surprised if something similar happens with rollups. Though I'd say that there's one more technical reason why you might care about using a specific TA layer. And that's that there are occasional cases where there are network effects for using the same DA layer as another rollup. And there's cases without involving bridging, that's generally less built out, but there's also just a simple case of a shared sequencer where a shared sequencer is effectively a DA layer that just provides really quick soft confirmations. And that's what Espresso is effectively building. So that has unsolved complexity as well, where for that to actually work, you need this off-chain builder market, which is actually not stateless. So you would need something a little bit more than just vanilla Celestia out of the box and out of the box to facilitate that. Okay. Yeah. Is it the case, Neil, just to dig into that? We just uh, recorded an episode with um, Justin Drake that, that came out um, before this episode is going to be released called the fixing fragmentation. And he was just very bullish in making the case for, um, you know, decentralized sequencers and even using Ethereum as sort of a, you know, shared sequencer to sort of help fix the growing problem across Ethereum rollups, which is this fragmentation problem. Are you saying, Neil, that using the same kind of DA layer um, is useful towards you know, like interop uh, interoperability across all of the these rollups? There's some sort of a like a network effect present there, and yeah, it, maybe you could describe that a little bit more. Yeah, and uh, that's a really interesting point that you just made about Ethereum itself being used as the shared sequencer for some kind of based rollup, and I think a, on some time frame for Ethereum DA to remain competitive they would have to implement some kind of upgrade like that. But the complexity that I was referring to is for this to actually work in practice, let's say you want to have two rollups, you deposit USDC on one side, and then you want DAI to come out on the other atomically. So the cases you really don't want is you deposited USDC and DAI did not come out, or conversely, you did not deposit USDC and DAI did come out. And what that requires is that someone at some point needs to run a full node for all of the rollups that are using the same shared sequencer and they need to give you some assurance. So typically some kind of economic security or they need to put some stake down that might be slashed. And that's what's required in order to provide that kind of interoperability and shared sequencers in general. There's other shared sequencer constructions like what Rome protocol is doing, but in general, that's how shared sequencers work. And my view is that there's like upper bounds on, uh, on how much how many rollups you can reasonably support with that kind of off-chain builder market. So I generally find the constructions like that don't scale very well. 
Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming, and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Arbitrum is accelerating the Web3 landscape with a suite of secure Ethereum scaling solutions. Hundreds of projects have already deployed onto Arbitrum 1 with a flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystem. Arbitrum Nova is quickly becoming a Web3 gaming hub and social dApps like Reddit are also calling Arbitrum home. And now Arbitrum Orbit allows you to use Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own layer 3, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. Faster transaction speeds and significantly lower gas fees. Are you a dev, but you don't know Solidity? With Stylus, Arbitrum's upcoming proposal for a programming environment upgrade, developers can write smart contracts in Rust, C, C++, and many more coding languages. Arbitrum empowers you to explore and build without compromise. Visit Arbitrum.io, where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first app on Arbitrum. It's everyone's favorite season in crypto, tax season. And crypto tax is always an absolute headache, especially for all you DGENs out there. But it doesn't have to be a nightmare. That's where Crypto Tax Calculator comes in. The software built for DGENs by DGENs. As Coinbase's official global tax partner, Crypto Tax Calculator focuses on making complex transactions into easy ones, supporting over 300,000 currencies across Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism, as well as a thousand other integrations as well. It's as simple as connecting your wallet, pulling in all your transactions, and following the automated suggestions to quickly and accurately calculate your tax obligations. Plus, for all the airdrop farmers out there, Crypto Tax Calculator has your back as they are consistently adding support for new and upcoming layer ones, layer twos, and all the airdrops that you're currently farming. 2024 is the year when the DGENs do their crypto taxes with speed and confidence. Make taxes this year easy and affordable with Crypto Tax Calculator. Sign up at CryptoTaxCalculator.io and get a 30% discount with code BANK30. Click the link in the show notes for more information. I want to unpack something you said, Neil, about um, the network effects around data availability. Um, are there any, really, is the, the question. So Celestia, like we have one uh, layer two pivoted toward from its DA from Ethereum to Celestia, the first one to go. And then like the second one followed just thereafter. From what I hear, there's going to be at least a few more. Um, and all of a sudden, there's going to be some sort of aggregation of uh, um, Celestia data availability consumption. Uh, what are the tailwinds for many, many, many people, organizations, networks consuming one like DA, DA layers, DA versus just a few? Like what, what kind of network effects, composability effects uh, does one DA layer get if it, it captures like most of the uh, con consumers? So a really clear one for Celestia in particular is if we're just all running light nodes, such as on every laptop, every cell phone, then that means you probably have pretty good coverage of those blocks. So to that point I was making earlier in that there's security reasons why you would not want to just arbitrarily scale the, the bandwidth and increase the blocks for full nodes. If you have very good confidence that there actually are a lot of non-duplicative light nodes that are auditing these blocks, then that might be able to, to allow you to scale the blocks bigger and therefore they're going to be less saturated and the costs will go down. So that's one network effect that you'd hope will play out in practice. I think the only concern there is, does Celestia governance have the incentive required in order to actually increase the block size. Because that's something that they're gonna have to vote, vote for. And ultimately the biggest Celestia token holders, it's gonna be delegated to the validators or the guys running the chain. And they might say, why are you making me increase my hardware requirements if I'm not getting any upside from that? Like I get that that's better for the network and the fees will go down, but on average I might actually end up making less money if you do that. Interesting, John, anything you wanna add here? I definitely think that Celestia will continue to increase their block size um, over time would be my guess. Um, m mostly because, I mean, it's kind of just my general view 
of where does the value in the system probably go to. Um, so I, I don't think DA is particularly sticky um, in the long run, I, I or even in the short run, really on any time span. Um, I think we've seen that kind of clearly um, from all these rollups that have, like once the first one goes, there's this wave of, all right, yeah, like if Celestia is acceptable, I'm not going to stick around in ETH DA and like charge my users like 10,000 X more fees because now I'm not competitive. I um, mean, people will move over to that. I think that there is... Uh, stickiness within a group of people understand that these are reliable operators that they're comfortable with. So I think that today, like people are going to go, it's not like it is reasonable for someone to say, oh yeah, I'm moving off of Ethereum DA and I'm going to go use Celestia DA. It's not reasonable for someone to say, oh, we're switching out ETH DA and I'm going to use like this random chain that you've like never heard of for DA. Um, so I think within that realm of like, this is a reliable operator and brand that people understand, um, people will stick around that. Um, but I, I don't think that there's going to be this long-term effect of everyone really needs to be on one shared DA layer. Um, the, the points that Neil made are, are accurate of like, you do get theoretically better scaling properties of when everybody is sampling on the same DA layer, as opposed to um, splitting it up across many ones. Um, the math does work out better there. Um, also, you do get better trustless interop between, or at least the ability to do better trustless interop between chains on the shared uh, same shared DA layer. Um, in practice, I don't think that we have seen much of a real revealed preference for people to like care that much about that of this like trustless bridging between them people are like generally okay with like a reliable bridge between them and like that's not really where the risk is um so i i tend to think that most of the network effects on that will be like relatively loose over time um it is just going to be the brand and like this is reliable it's scalable it's cheap people understand this it's safe that's what like people use they'll stay within that realm i think most of the stickiness is really just in like the state and the assets um, which is why I, I think that, like, it, like if you look at the cash flows of something like Celestia, um, and this is something that people have, like rightfully pointed out, is like uh, it's making like seventy five dollars a day or something like that. The um, whole network is making seventy five dollars yeah, yeah. a day. Yeah, and the and the background context here, John, is uh, like the fully diluted uh, value of of Celestia is like eighteen billion or something like this, right? Exactly. I think that we could say, I mean, like, okay, clearly the cost of this thing is not based on like a DCF of future cash flows, most likely, unless you actually have people who th are just thinking like, oh yeah, but at some point in five years from now, oh yeah, but this is going to go to like a billion a year run rate. And then so like the valuation makes sense. I, like, I don't think that people are doing that. I don't know that people ever will for most of these. Um, I think most of the stickiness is in like the asset itself. And that's what you see with Ethereum itself too, of like, People are pretty willing to switch DA to be like, okay, Celestia is reliable, it's cheap, I'm switching off Ethereum DA, I'm going to use Celestia DA. People still want ETH, the asset and all of the state that is there. And like that tends to be the stickier thing in my mind. Um, and, and that is why I also think it probably makes, I, I think it is like probably important for something like Celestia um, that the token is able to derive value in some form of like money-like way, whatever that means over the long run. Um, because I, I don't think that you're going to get like a meaningful valuation on this thing based on the DCF of future cash flows in the future. Yeah, I guess to be fair, like Celestia had to launch prior to rollups posting to it, just by nature of the fact that it's a proof of stake chain. So they have to launch that token even before the cash flows start coming in. Uh, though I just think it's hard to become money. Like we, there are very few assets in general that have become money. We only know two digital assets have, that have ever done it, Bitcoin, ETH. And I guess USDC borrows the moneyness of the US dollar. And I suspect that part of that is because of the fact that ETH and Bitcoin are constrained at the base layer. So as a result, it forces this asymmetry of demand or incongruity of demand with respect to supply, and it forces it to be deflationary. So I don't know if it's possible for that to ever happen again. It seems like more as like a freak accident of history, where if you tried to deploy a constrained base layer today, people would be like, why would I use that over Celestia, Solana, all the other guys? But that basically means that only ETH and Bitcoin will ever be money, according to that theory. Oh, this is the heart of the conversation yeah. that I think uh -huh. we want to have with you. There's probably a few things we got to lay out first. Yeah, uh, me, me and uh, I have an episode scheduled with Nick to unpack this whole like modular money meme that the Celestia people would love for you to think that TI is modular money. I think we'll start to open up that conversation, but I think that's going to be a multi-episode conversation. Um, Bankless listeners will be familiar with this, infinitely familiar with this line from Bankless, blockchain sell blocks. What does Ethereum do? Produces blocks and sells them. Uh, what does a DA layer do? DA layers sell DA. Uh, and so there is a cash flow analysis that could be done for someone with, uh, who, someone who sells DA. 
Uh, it's different than just a typical like Ethereum monetary premium because of all the, th the reasons that we've described on Bankless thousands of times before. But I really want to unpack just the raw economics of the DA business. How does DA make money? How does producing and selling DA make money? John, you talked about a little bit earlier that you kind of expect the margins to approach pretty slim over time, but that's also, you know, uh, compensated for by volume. Uh, can you just unpack what you think about the economics of the DA, uh, bit the business model for DA? The simplest framing, which I'll copy and start with, um, is from Serum, I believe, is like basically breaking down the simplest way to think of it, I think, is you can think of like, there's basically like kind of three fundamental components of like, what is the cost for DA to provide it? Um, one is the operational cost of like, literally, like, what is the cost to run the boxes? Um, two is the capital cost for economic security of, hey, like if I'm going to put up, you know, X billion dollars of stake, like I need some return on that. Like what's the return on that? Um, and then the last thing is congestion, which is like primarily what all of Ethereum is today of like, you know, there's just not enough space for all the demands or like price has to go up. That's just how the market works. Um, uh, in general, like what we see today for um, other, other than Celestia, but what we see for at least for Ethereum is that pretty much all pricing is like congestion based of like the cost of Ethereum DA is in no way representative of what is the actual cost of running the network for these nodes and like, okay, I need X return on my ETH stake. Um, it is entirely representative of there is X amount of DA and people want a lot more than X. Um, so price goes up. Um, that is like in practice how everything is priced today. Um, my general assumption that we've kind of talked about is I, I don't think that's sustainable or that works over time. I don't, I don't think that the stickiness and demand for one layer is going to just like vastly outstrip the supply of it in like the super long run, because I think we'll just get more supply that's like reasonable and people will go over to Celestia or go over to Avail, go over to Eigen DA. Um, so what you kind of end up more with is like some function of the operational and capital costs is what like actually matters. I think the operational costs of running most networks is going to approach being like relatively low over the long run. It doesn't actually cost that much for like, you know, some set of 100 or 1,000, whatever participants to like run the validators, like actually operate the network. And so then lastly, like it's mostly capital cost. Um, these systems like shouldn't be expensive to run. Um, so then it's the question of uh, like economic security. How much do you care about economic security? Um, is that like a real thing? Um, and that's kind of what it comes down to a bit at the end. Uh, if you believe that congestion costs mostly go away, operational costs are pretty low. It's like, okay, if you want $20 billion stake of economic security, like there needs to be some return on that capital of, you know, what is it like 4% a year or like whatever the number may be for the different asset and the capital cost will vary for different assets. And so like, this is part, I mean, like this is part of like Eigen DA um, and Eigen layers. Like this is exactly why they designed the way that they did. I was like, they think that this is the fundamental biggest cost at the end of the day. So how do we, you know, get a cheap capital mm -hmm. cost? We just reuse the same capital that's already being used for Ethereum. Interesting. Um, there's no like perfect solution to this because, okay, we're reusing that capital, but in some sense, you're, that means you're diluting the economic security like across more applications, but you can make the other argument that like, okay, but pooling economic security is better. So it's like a nonlinear amount. Uh, like it, it's unclear. It, it kind of just basically depends on like, how much do you actually care about the economic security in your system? Is that what you're prioritizing off of? My like general view for the long run on most of these systems, I think the prioritization of economic security will go down. Um, because I, I think that people, or I think that people will like at least realize that, uh, the current numbers of like economic security today, I don't think are like accurately representative of like the current state when the, it's the simple idea of like practically like pretty much all stake is delegated. Uh, so I, I think that the like practical amount of economic security, I think that people will start to care less over that over time. Um, and you start to just see these get systems getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over time, because I think the operational costs are just going to get better and better. And they're already not that high. Congestion costs will go down because we have a lot of this available. And capital costs, I, I don't think that people are going to be willing to pay some DA layer based on like, oh, I need X billion dollars of economic security, and that one's not enough, so I'm going to charge my users 10 times more to use this one that has X billion dollars of economic security. I, I don't think that's going to happen in practice. Um, so th those are really the three main components. Um, and pretty much all of them I see trending down over time. Um, and I, I think that's what we'll continue to see. I think, yeah, the optimal pricing is somewhat a function of what theory of pricing you're using. So for Ethereum in general, it's optimizing total welfare. And that means that it's literally saying, let's maximize who gets who gets the goods should be based on who wants it the most. And whoever supplies the goods should be whoever is able to supply it at the cheapest. But if you look at like the optimization function on layer twos, 
I think that objective is fundamentally more complex because there's this informal goal of also wanting like many non-economical use cases to still be possible. And then on the other hand, the layer two also needs to be economically incentivized to exist. Meaning that like in order to compensate whatever surrounding hardware there is to keep the layer two running, um, it can't be like paying too much to the base layer. So that's like fundamentally at odds with providing some baseline rate of return for the L1 who needs to pay for its economic security. Something that's unique about the DA business model is that DA as a commodity can be like, quote unquote, minted out of thin air, right? Like there's actually no one stopping you from making more DA. And so it like, it's like having, you know, a money printer with fiat money, but no one's stopping you from printing all the money. And that's kind of the whole point about DA layers, competitive DA layers, is that if we need more, we can supply more. Uh, and so that makes me kind of think that the economics, to go back to what you're, you've been saying this entire time, John, is like the economics are just that you, DA, DA just gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and the margins also get slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. Yeah, that's generally the direction I see it going. Okay, yeah. so then there's kind of a question here, which is like really the, the big question I think in everyone's mind, and David already alluded to this, is like, how does this all pan out? Um, yeah. So we look at um, Celestia right now. It's actually number 11. I just, I just looked this up in terms of fully diluted market cap. Number 11, okay? So we're talking $18 billion. That means it's surpassed uh, Arbitrum, actually, at the time of recording. Arbitrum's just a hair under um, the value of Celestia, right? And certainly we've seen massive categories of uh, infrastructure, you know, chains and that sort of thing spring up and like suddenly be worth in the, the tens of billions of dollars, right? So this isn't the first time it's happened, but the question is, is this like a flash in the pan? Is this sustainable? Is uh, the DA category going to increase? We also see with, with Eigen DA, something similar. I mean, it's like not, um, you know, trading right now, but the the amount of frenetic activity is just like restaking and like in search of Eigen layer points, right? Right. Is like a market uh, points to evaluation, maybe in the double digit billions as well. So how do you explain this, John? Right. So like, our framing, it, basically, if you think of it in, in some ways, the entire genesis of Bankless is trying to figure out how we value um, crypto networks. And I feel like we've made some strides towards that. And we also still have the same unresolved questions, uh, like outstanding. But basically, it's kind of like the, the Bankless thesis is like there's three kind of asset superclasses. You have capital assets that are discounted cash flows. And you have these things called commodities. And then you have things with, you know, monetary premium associated with it. And I, I don't know if that's how you, you think of the, the, the framing of where value is going to accrue. But can you explain why this network is worth uh, $18 billion and like give maybe a, a bull case for why it should go higher? Uh, it's worth 18 billion because there's more buyers or sellers. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> it's probably about the best answer. It's a hot have. airdrop target. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, in practice, I, I think we could say that like the vast majority of these types of projects are really priced off of like mindshare. Um, like, in like, especially in the short term, uh, like that's what they're priced off of, not kind of any kind of DCF. Um, obviously, there's a big difference between, okay, what is it worth now and what's it going to be worth in 10 years? Um, and I think the latter tends a bit more towards like, okay, what are the fundamentals of the kind of thing? And both systems in the bull case, like certainly do make sense, even from a cash flow perspective of if you make the argument that, you know, something like Celestia or Egg and DA, like a single system can provide a like massive amount of DA bandwidth such that like it actually comprises like a very meaningful service, a large part of crypto, that kind of thing, um, even at a like modest multiple on operational costs. Um, if there's like millions of TPS going through this thing, well, it's like a modest so margin you could on make that the, is... the DCF, the capital asset sort of case for this, if you assume yeah. just really big numbers. Yeah, exactly. And, and that like actually is like a pretty understandable thing in the long run of like, yeah, okay, there's a million TPS through the system that's like going through this thing and it's able to charge like some margin over the operational costs and at enough scale that is a lot of money um, and that actually makes sense the obvious reality is like most systems won't achieve that scale i think there's a fair argument that like some of them will be gigantic 
Um, so that is like a relatively simple understanding of it. But I mean, like, obviously, th this is one of those order of magnitude things where I think you can make a reasonable case that it stays within a couple orders of magnitude of today, or it could go like, you know, a million times higher. And then like, then the valuation makes sense. So I mean, at, at this kind of stage, no one's trying to do, I think, any kind of practical DCF of like, okay, I can underwrite to this, you know, you know, one person thinks it'll be 100,000 TPS, the other person argues it'll be 100 million TPS going through the system, like you have no idea. Um, but there is a reasonable argument for that. I mean, for the restaking stuff, I mean, I, I would say it's not so dissimilar to liquid staking. Um, and like those will start to converge too. of like staking services are actually like one of the very few pretty cash flow generative businesses um, in most of crypto. Like there's a lot of cash flow that's going through the system to the extent that you have like meaningful net network effects or like a good operator in the space, like being able to charge like some margin on top of that, like is actually a sensible business model in the long run. Um, again, it's one of those things where you can make a very rational argument for the correct order of magnitude of this business in the long run to be, you know, somewhere between like a million times apart of like, what is the scale of this thing going to be? Like, you have no idea. Like there's a reasonable outcome that like it ends up issuing the main asset and is like the hub of most staking and like the entire ecosystem. And then it's gigantic, you know, because taking a small percentage off of that is, um, is a lot. In practice, that's the, I, don't, I don't think that's what most of them are priced on in the short term. Like most of them are priced in the short term. Like what is the mind share of this thing? Like where is the where is kind of the money going in the ecosystem? That's what most of it is like, particularly in the short term. When I think of trying to price crypto assets based on DCFs, the irony is that the few assets that actually do generate cash flow seem to be mm -hmm. underpriced relative to non-crypto alternatives. And then all the ones that don't generate cash flow are doing quite well. So I Fundamentals think, are bearish yeah. in crypto. Everyone knows it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Arbitrum was doing like nine figures ARR just kind of recently. So I thought that was good. Of course, it's still by a Web2 SaaS multiple would, that would land it in like the billions or something, not in the tens of billions. But yeah, I, I generally don't, I just don't think about price too much. Well, well but John, John, I want to ask the question then uh, back to kind of like modeling this. Is, is there any element you think that TIA is being um, projected forward as having some sort of monetary premium? I think Neil earlier in this episode said, hey, there's some special things that happened with Bitcoin and like maybe it was replicated. Bankless has long argued that's been kind of replicated with Ethereum that is sort of this pristine collateral. It's accruing this monetary premium. Do you think uh, the same is being assumed of of, of TIA and, and Celestia and some of these DA providers? And do you think that's actually a viable path here? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I mean, like the, the DCF aspect of it, I, I think while well, someone can get their head around it, I mean, like as a personal investor in both Celestia and Eigenlayer, I can promise you I've never even tried to do a DCF of either one of them because I do not <laughs> think that like that is a sensible way to be trying to evaluate these at all. Um, it, like it doesn't make sense. I would definitely say that head and shoulders above everything, uh, Bitcoin and ETH are the only two assets in crypto that have like approached any level of like serious monetary consideration, decentralization, all of these types of things. I do think that there's a reasonable argument that other assets will be able to do that in the future, though. Um, I think it's more likely than not that at least something else will get into that category. I don't know that there will be soon. I don't know that there will be many of them. Um, but I, I think it is reasonable to assume on a long enough time span that other ones or some handful can get into that. And Celestia is unique in that I think that at least architecturally, it is reasonably well positioned of like, what is something that could potentially get into that category that makes sense? Particularly just the way that the asset will be naturally kind of used throughout the whole ecosystem, like maps pretty reasonably well to Ethereum, where like a lot of why Ethereum is taken off is because it's like used as this asset throughout across like a many chain ecosystem in particular, with chains like Eclipse being the perfect example, like by default, hey, I spin up a new, t a new chain on top of this thing, people want to use ETH. Okay, cool. ETH is going to be the native gas token for my rollup because like that's what people want to use. And that kind of just like becomes self-reinforcing. Um, I think there's a reasonable likelihood that in the world where Celestia is quite successful, that you will see chains that spin up that by default, like they launch without a token, they use TIA as the gas token, stuff becomes denominated in TIA. In the like ultimate bull case, where like, okay, that is a, this is where the trend keeps going. And there's a lot of those chains that keep doing that. You end up in a world where, okay, now there's a substantial amount of t activity where, you know, it's users using TIA, stuff is denominated in TIA, et cetera. Um, I think that today we're obviously nowhere near there. Um, if for nothing else on the one, the simple monetary properties of like, yeah, it's a high inflation rate, like that doesn't really map well to something that people can understand and like be consistent with. Um, 
And the other part, uh, the more important part is honestly just ownership distribution. Um, and that's the biggest part again, where like Bitcoin and Ethereum are just like so far apart is like the ownership of this thing. Um, and the practical direction of it is driven by so many people, um, versus something like Celestia or pretty much any other layer one in existence today for the most part is just like, okay, it is still held in large part by like a reasonably small amount of entities. Um, the monetary properties are like not quite there. You're not as sure of what they're going to be. So it is a very long path for like anything else to get in that category of the two of them. But if we think that like a few of these systems are going to reach like unbelievable scale, I think it's like reasonable to expect that like at least something can get into that category of like being a money like asset. So I think they're like reasonably well positioned among the candidates. But I mean, certainly compared to Bitcoin and Ethereum today, like I mean, orders of magnitude apart in like the types of qualities of the asset. Yeah, seeing a roll up to use TIA as gas or TIA to denominate the ecosystem, I think would be evidence of that theory which I haven't heard of any rollups doing yet. And then the other weird thing about TIA is that it's kind of like inverse money in the sense that people are buying it, staking it, and then waiting for airdrops. So they kind of want to get free stuff for not spending it. Whereas ETH is like something that you actually leave your money in. And I, that's why I think that the ETH community should continue to lean into the original narrative of programmable money, because that's what's unique about ETH, especially even compared to Bitcoin. No one's really doing stuff in a programmable way with Bitcoin at this point. Interesting. I, I can actually envision some properties of of Celestia to put on a, a Celestia Tia is money cap. Um, like some amount of cash flow is great. Uh, but like imagine in a world where like I think we all know that the uh, can assume that there's going to be more roll ups on Celestia using Celestia for DA than than what there are today. Call it a hundred. Call it a thousand. And in the bull, you know, the, the cool thing about Celestia. Uh, and Ethereum is that they the overlap for their vision about the future of crypto, uh, it overlaps decently well. Like the Celestia allows for more Ethereum rollups. I'm super into that idea. Uh, and say we have like, you know, we start to get into the thousands and tens of thousands of, of rollups deploying their data availability on Celestia. And maybe Celestia's margins and the DCF model just doesn't look good before all the reasons that we've dis discussed. There's still some brand power, some governance power that Celestia has over these rollups because so many people are using Celestia for data availability. Like governance, uh, governance is like the ability, the value of governance is the ability to direct stuff uh, and if that is this one central network that has this one brand called Celestia and the brand is a trusted brand to place your trusted DA, uh, that brand and, and monetary premium, actually, there's not too much difference between those two things. Uh, so I, I can start to see like the shape of this uh, nebulous theory start to, to fold form together, even though there are plenty of also reasons to be to be skeptical. John, Neil, anyone, any either of you want to reflect on that? So I think the brand and monetary premium actually will be quite different things. Um, mm. Like using Eclipse as a good test case of this, like the theoretical architecture here is like Eclipse is going to very likely pay more in cash flows to Celestia than it will to Ethereum on like a steady state basis going forward. I would also argue that Eclipse like actually accrues significantly more value to ETH than it does to TIA, like by a very wide margin, even though it was paying like more dollars to Celestia. Um, so I, I think in the world where the majority of Celestia use cases are chains like Eclipse, where they are like primarily Ethereum centric L2s, where most of the activity is denominated in ETH, that's what people use. That's like kind of the like the money like asset in the system. Um, I think most of that value actually goes to Ethereum in that world. I think the world where TIA can like kind of sustain that own value of itself um, is if TIA as the asset starts to become used much more in those ecosystems where Celestia isn't just for scaling Ethereum L2s, Celestia is for making Celestia rollups, um, where TIA is kind of the asset, they are much more native to there. I think that's where it will actually derive more value if that starts to happen. Um, because if in the other one, um, where it's like mostly the Eclipse type architectures of the world, I think it's mostly just like, a background service provider that like makes sense as a business, um, but then is much more of a like, okay, well, what are the cash flows in the system? Because I'm not using it as money. It's not this thing that I use all the time. It's like, okay, like what, like what is the thing for? Um, so I, I think getting the asset used throughout the ecosystem is like actually what like matters a lot. And so like where that goes, I think will determine a lot of it on like a longer time scale. I agree. And seeing that usage uh, to, to, to both of your points, right? Yeah, and Neil saying a, a roll-up kind of denominating their, the gas fees in TIA, that would be an indication that 
there's some broader acceptance as a monetary premium here. Like the monetary premium thing is just so mysterious, right? Because like mm-hmm. when you boil it all down, you're just like, what, um, what is the path to achieve monetary premiums? Like enough people believe that it's a money, right? I mean, like if you boil it all down, it just sounds nonsensical and stupid, but mm-hmm. that's kind of what we're talking about here. Now, if it follows the same path that Bitcoin and Ethereum did, it has to go through this kind of distribution type era where to your point, John, it has to get it out of the hands of VCs and whales, the full supply has to come to the market. You know, Bitcoin did this famously through proof of work, fair distribution. Um, Ethereum had a lot of years of going through proof of work. Also has to go through its like ultrasound money uh, phase. I mean, there was a time where Ethereum was a lot worse at being money than it is today. And it's gotten better over time. It's kind of a hardening of its mon- like monetary policy uh, and the credible neutrality of that. And it also kind of the narrative that surrounds it. So it's a long path, but um, there is a needle that it could possibly thread there, I guess is uh, interesting um, to, to, to see. W- w- what else would you say on kind of like DA in general and like what is what can we expect to see uh, in the next one to three years in this in this category? We've talked about Celestia, Eigen DA is going to come online. I think that's going to be um, probably large. I don't know what you'd say about that, but what, what should investors uh, look for in the DA category, uh, John? The main thing I'm going to be curious to see is, so Eigen DA um, expects, it, it seems like sometime around middle-ish of this year um, is kind of the expectation of it. Um, and then avail sometime as well. Um, the thing that I still have not had uh gotten a great answer for is, okay, when these systems are live, what are they actually going to get to use them and why over something like Celestia, when Celestia is going to have this like one year head start and like a meaningful amount of like reliability and just kind of um, like understanding of like, this is kind of the default of like, okay, I'm like, I need to reduce my cost as an L2. Like, this is what I go use. People understand that. Um, I, I haven't seen a great answer for like, okay, why is the next thing going to pick Eigen DA or Avail instead of Celestia on the go forward? Um, the, the most common argument is just like cost. Um, and the thing that I have not been super compelled with so far is that once we start talking about these orders of magnitude, does the cost matter anymore? And my intuition is like probably no. Of I think the cost matters a lot when you're talking about like going from Ethereum to Celestia, where it's like, okay, you go from two dollars a swap on one of these current like Ethereum rollups often to okay, you're on the order of like fractions of a penny. But does it matter when you go from, let's say that Celestia is, you know, a, a tenth of a penny and Eigen DA is a thousandth of a penny? Is that going to matter for a lot of use cases that will actually attract them? I, I think the first jump is like a very material difference because it's a very user facing and present thing of like, OK, this is a clear pitch for me. Like, obviously, this is way better. Um, I, I don't know that my intuition is like there's probably pretty decreasing returns on that. Um, so I don't know that that's going to be a meaningful pitch. Um, so that, that is the main thing that I'm really looking for still is like, what is going to be the pitch of these new ones that's been up? Um, the simplest thing that would change that is like, does Celestia just get expensive at some point? Does it start to like actually fill up because it becomes the default thing and it actually can't scale enough. If that starts to happen, then you'll definitely see this happen immediately. Like obviously when people will leave Celestia, if Celestia gets starts to get expensive, the whole point of Celestia is it's supposed to be really cheap. Um, so th- that's kind of the main thing. That would also be for. very bullish crypto and crypto a- apps. That means we yeah. were yes. very successful, hopefully, yes. with something. And Neil, what yes. would you add to this? You would have so many Ponzi's. Yeah. <laughs> Neil, what would you add to this, maybe from a, a builder, a, a um, DA buyer's perspective? So I think Eigen DA is a little bit more differentiated than Avail relative to last year, just given that the trust assumptions are different, though I think it is still pretty marginal compared to ETH native DA. Avail, on the other hand, what they've basically done is they're giving a ZK proof of the erasure encoding to make sure that the block was extended correctly. And it's a pretty marginal improvement. It's also pretty expensive to generate the ZK proof. So I don't think that it's possible for it to really get cheaper per se. And then that exact optimization was mentioned in the original data availability sampling white paper that was co-authored between Mustafa and Vitalik. So that's all to say that I think Avail is fundamentally less differentiated from a positioning standpoint compared to Celestia. Uh, whereas I and DA, I could see having some novel angle, but I agree that it'd have to be something different than cost, unless for that edge case where Celestia got really expensive. The things that I think in practice that I've seen that are probably the most likely to be differentiated, I, I agree with that also that I can DA is 
the one that is far more likely to be meaningfully differentiated, I, I don't see a strong width avail. I think it will come down to like BD and stuff like that if avails again edge. Um, with EigenDA, the although it's super early and I haven't seen like any meaningful details on it, um, but things that they have talked about that are interesting. Um, one is the idea of like potentially um, having the ability to kind of like reserve DA bandwidth ahead of time. Um, I don't know how you do that in a not super trusted way, um, but the idea of like being able to like, okay, for the next year, I want to buy X amount of DA at this cost and like, great, now I can set that aside. Like I, I don't have to worry about uh, prices changing in the future. That's very interesting. Um, they seem to at least be looking into that. Um, the other obvious one that I think um, is much easier to implement and people will almost certainly use um, is different forms of like dual uh, dual token staking, which is kind of interesting of like you can have a roll up that is using EigenDA, um, but also like have a dual token staking model where like maybe your roll up also needs to be staked. Um, and my intuition is that there will be certainly enough change to at least want to play around with that and kind of just like, you know, whether that's like perceived added utility for their own token or whatever it is, um, people will more likely than not play around with that. Um, so I, I think that like simple economic tweaks that are not available with Celestia are things that people I think will reasonably want to play around with. Um, and then the obvious of just like, this is the one that is at least perceived as more of like an extension of Ethereum. Like that that's what people will look at it for. We we haven't talked mm -hmm. about Solana this entire episode. Can Solana be used as a DA layer? Do you think that's a po possible future at all? Does it have good DA or bad DA? They definitely have a lot of it. They have a <laughs> lot of DA, but I don't know if it's really good in the sense that there's no DAS. And I think that they probably wouldn't implement something like DAS, just given that the Solana North Star is so different than the Ethereum North Star. And therefore, I'm starting to realize that it's not as suitable for rollups as a base layer or settlement layer. And it's mostly because their North Star really is performance. And I think it's a great goal, maximize throughput, minimize latency. But there's no, it's missing that like constraint of verifiability in the same way that the Ethereum ecosystem has. And that's to say that when it comes to things like fraud proofs, which do require additional commitment data to be posted, or in the case of ZK proving the entire chain, you have to pay that cost. And if it's not internalized by the chain's economics, then someone has to pay it. So that's all to say that it's unlikely that Solana would do those things if they were to adversely impact costs, which they will. Uh, and therefore it's probably best suited to almost someone like Eclipse to build in those kinds of features. So I think that Solana Turbine is like very scalable DA in the sense that they're they're trying to approach the cost of, of bandwidth, and so is Celestia, but the erasure encoding that they're using is not suitable for DAS. And that erasure encoding is optimized just to pump as many blocks through as possible, uh, as opposed to the Celestia and erasure encoding, which, as mentioned, is like this 2D erasure encoding, which is just fundamentally less efficient. DAS, data availability sampling, it's like a mechanism for scaling DA. Um, Neil, John, I have learned a ton in this podcast. It's exactly the podcast I wanted to produce. Uh, so a lot of my questions have been answered, but are there further questions out on the frontier? Like what, what, what big questions for the industry kind of remain in the DA space, would you say? Do you have anything, like if you could just snap your fingers and get a question answered, like what would it We're be? We're looking for bankless episode ideas here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> The thing that I'm uh, very interested to see and don't have any strong views on, still seems early, um, is what is the path for Ethereum DA uh, post EIP 4844 um, and pre the potential future of dank sharding? Um, is there uh, a meaningful interim kind of steps that you can take um, that will be valuable and that will actually be pursued and be practical on like a reasonable time span. Um, and there's definitely at least some research around that, like um, stuff like the peer DAS papers. Um, so people are looking into it. Um, it. It seems still rather early stage of like, it's not going to be prioritized in like the next fork uh, Pectra after uh, 424. Um, but is there a reasonable path to like actually scaling Ethereum DA pre the like full optimal dank sharding design um, in a shorter time horizon. I, I think that would be quite interesting, um, but still quite early on that. Neil, what qu big questions do you have? To add to something that John was saying earlier as a differentiator of EigenDA, which is the reserve pricing, I'm hoping that the market solves blob space financialization or even Celestia block financialization. So that'd be hedging mostly. But I know that a lot of people talked about block space financialization for a long time, block space derivatives, and that never really got built out. And it's partly because of the asymmetry of the pricing. 
because the block space price can vary very wildly, and there's no one who can really absorb that kind of asymmetric risk. But if you can somehow involve the blob pr proposers, then maybe there's some way to offer physical delivery. But that's an area of research that I've been following pretty closely. Well, guys, this has been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much for joining us today and explaining the world of uh, data publishing. We'll uh, <laughs> conclude on that note, try to meme that into existence. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for having us on. Bankless Nation, got to let you know, of course, uh, crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot.